Well, as someone who just moved halfway across the country, maybe this is going to be an answer of more of what community is not, but um, I just moved across the country and, and felt like I left my whole community and kind of felt pretty alone for a while and was feeling kind of homesick. And kind of what I learned through that is what I was feeling like was the community was only the people that were around me. And now I feel like I have this great opportunity to have community here and also community at home. And it's not that I have to be in the same physical space as my community to be a part of a community, that it is really people who, who you can be with and love and whether that's in person or, or through a text message, um, knowing that, that you have people who are around. So I'm hearing that community can be both like lifelong community and like just beginning. Yeah. And you gravitate, you find a community that will feed into you, that will love you, accept you, um, say, hey, I know you're, you're brand new here, but hey, like let's come alongside each other and like share and grow together, uh, be open-minded together, you know, who are you? A community is, some, is people who want to know who you are and, and, and everyone has kind of like their own unique contribution to to the conversation or things like that yeah. and it can be um, chosen you can choose your own community or you can be plopped into a community like you all were um, with with resurrection um, you can also um, I think um, I can I consider uh, maybe other um, persons um, of color to be like a community I'm part of or uh, graduated from a certain school and I'm part of that community. So there, there are certain things connected with our identity that can um, connect us with the community. Yeah, that's a good marker, I guess, criteria mm -hmm. for a healthy community, right? Right, right? If the community that you're involved with is, is meeting the, that criteria, then that, that's good. And we hope that Res Life is that, right. is meeting those marks. And if that community is not, you know, if, it, if it's not supporting you or lifting you up or, or letting you know your worth or letting you have a voice to be seen and heard, then, then maybe that's not a community that's, that's right for you or healthy for you. And, and the church is a faith community that should be um, welcoming and inviting and accepting of whoever comes and is part of that. Um, and that should be a sign. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes, yes. How do we do community well in that space? Well, it's a very good question. I, I think going, I think like some of the stuff that even Pastor Show just got through saying, right? Um, you definitely want to, you know, have a culture, uh, an environment where people are accepted, right? Um, I believe also in uh, inclusivity, right? Um, we often use this word, especially in the faith community, like, hey, we want to be diverse, right? And when we say that, we talk about, okay, we want, you know, people from all races, all backgrounds, all walks of life to join us. And, and, and you know, yeah, we're, we're a diverse community. But I say we need to even push that even further, right? The word needs to be, we need to be an inclusive community. Um, there's this phrase that says, you know, um, diversity is like being invited to, to the barbecue dinner, but inclusivity is being invited not only to the barbecue dinner, but then also being uh, allowed to dance at that part, you know? Um, in other words, you're, you're sharing your gifts, right? And you're sharing what you have to offer. And I think now more than ever, when we do talk about our faith community, um, especially with um, our young ones, our high schoolers, right? Man, they are gifted. They are talented. And they're, they're I mean, they're, they're really rocking the boat. I mean, especially coming up. And I think we need to hear them and we need to accept them and we need to allow them to use their, their, their brilliant minds and their creativity uh, to continue to build on, on community. The treatment of all people fair, fairly, um, uh, in, with love, also with um, equality, uh, regardless of who you are. Shouldn't matter what community you're part of or who you, who you are, um, ethnically, socially, no matter what your status, um, you have a right. Everyone has a right to be treated the same. Well, then also to that point, right? I mean, I think of. Um, 
you know, the justice within the world that we see, right? Because I was just having a conversation with, with my high school the other day about this, and she's like, oh man, daddy, you know, we, we live in an unjust world. And I was like, what do you mean by that, right? And she's like, well, there's obviously, you just see the crime, you just see the hate, you see, you know, how, how does God want us to respond to all of that? And, you know, yes, we say the, the words like, well, show love and, and walk with people and meet people where they are, but, you know, justice also comes with, um, you know, it, it has to come with a prophetic voice. Um, there was a theologian, uh, one of my favorite writers, his name is Walter Brueggemann, and he says, everyone should, all of us are prophets, right? All of, them have, all of us have a way of using our prophetic imagination, right? And what is a prophet? Well, someone who speaks truth, right, for the current realities, but also looking at into the future of what it can be. Right, okay, too often we get stuck, right? Like this is where we are and we're in disagreement with one another. But man, can we look to a better future? Can we look to a better tomorrow, right? And that's gonna take some work, right? Another way to look at justice is restorative justice. It's one of my favorite words um, because you're looking at both sides, those who have done the harm and those who have been harmed. And too often, you know, we focus on those who have done the harm, but we forget those who have been harmed, right? And, and we gotta we gotta clear that up. We gotta make sure we're taking care of both parties. Um, so you know, and the church has been guilty of that, right? Um, for a woman, you know, who was told you can't preach, right. or you can't be an elder, you can't be ordained, right? I can't imagine that, yeah. right? And even I'm sure you still get some of that today, right? Yeah. You know, people saying like, well, you shouldn't be behind the pulpit. Um, and then the justice piece with me graciously saying, uh, excuse me, you're wrong, and let's the center and talk about this, right? But yeah, it's uh, it's hard work, but it's much needed work. And it, it looks different in a lot of various situations, but I think it takes courage. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking about this um, shirt one from one of our conferences, Fearless. You have to be, you have to have courage, you have to be fearless. Um, to live a life that that is just mm -hmm. towards others yeah. um, because it's too easy to go with the um, status quo it's too easy to go with peer pressure mm -hmm. um, if someone's being done wrong and when you sense that um, this isn't right this isn't fair this isn't just um, it takes courage to step out and say I'm not going to do what you're doing. Right. I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. Um, that's justice in action. Mm -hmm. You know, my um, daughter started kindergarten this year. Mm -hmm. So we're talking a lot about fairness and justice in our house mm -hmm. in our, uh, as she's um, experiencing a whole new community in public school, um, just in school in general. In the past couple weeks, um, she came home right after Martin Luther King Day, and we've had these conversations with her before, but it's the first time that it really resonated with her, and she came home and she said, Mom, did you know that people are mean to people because of their skin? And I was like, I did know that. Where did you learn about that? She said, I learned about it at school, and I don't understand. And I said, well, what don't you understand? Let's talk about it. And she said, well, it's not fair. We're supposed to love everyone. I don't understand why someone would treat someone differently. Oh, at the mouth of babe. Right. And we had this beautiful conversation and it just is like, it made me wonder what happens that it's almost like she, she was born with this idea of living out justice and then something changes at some point maybe we get wrapped up in differences but it it was innate in who she was um, this this idea of loving others and treating others with with justice or or fairly or with with equality and um, it was just this beautiful moment that we had too late to start asking questions 
um, and you can make a change in, in how you relate to people and interact with people at any time. Like just, yeah, but you have to take that first step sometimes to ask questions and start having conversations or the first time that you confront your friends when they're, when they're saying something that they shouldn't be saying and that makes your community not a safe space. And, and that's hard, but taking that first step makes it a little bit easier every time, I think. Right? Hear people's stories. Hear people's walks of life and area. I promise you, you're gonna learn something. You're gonna connect and you're gonna grow and it's gonna move you. It should move you, right? To, to make a change or to say, you know what, you're accepted, right? I mean, I, I think that's one of the things that, that we try to you know, continue to do within the work that we're you know, doing with the beloved community. Right, listening to one another. I think that that conversation, that hearing, that listening, um, really tears down those walls of um, the isms, the racism, sexism, ableism, just can tear down those walls. And when you can start connecting with an individual, um, you say, oh, they're, they're human too, just like me, you know, and uh, that does such a world of good, such a world of good. And hearing from all, all walks of life, realizing that um, it, it, differences aren't always seen, right? Um, we're different in a multiple ways, wh whether it's um, race, uh, socioeconomics, um, where we come from, also, you know, different learning disabilities or styles of learning or, you know, within our schools, understanding like you may not know what that other person is either battling or, or walking through, you don't know. Um, but being aware of just listening to their story, listening to who they are. I think um, one of the most important things is to experience these these things in life. Like I, I know for me, like one of the things I was really passionate about in, in high school is is learning about like homelessness and and what that you know how that how that is affecting the world and and realizing that not all homeless people are crazy bad people some of them just got stuck in a bad situation or you think like prison ministry um, like being like there's opportunities to go inside prisons and when you do stuff like that you realize that not everyone in prison is a horrible person some of them just got stuck in a bad situation um, and I think that the big thing is experiencing and not being afraid to go on mission trips and go to other countries and and go see these these people and meet them where they're at and you begin to to develop a heart for for those people i think one piece when i think about learning and even for myself like breaking down stigmas i've had in the past and trying to be aware of how how was i raised and what are my kind of responses to things kind of based off my upbringing and and stuff like that and and i've been reflecting on like the church's resource like how to be anti-racist which is a big question um, and a, a really an invitation I think that we're all kind of called to Tino I was wondering if maybe you could kind of expand on that yeah. more yeah so it, it yeah it's a word that recently just has been used I think in the last what three to five years um, and I know it can get kind of you know cloudy a bit because when you hear the anti-racist like what does that what does that truly mean because at one point we were using language well I'm not racist right but I think we need to break these definitions down right when we talk about racism right we're talking about a race that is superior over another, or that looks at other races as superior right and so um, yes you are being anti-racist you are actively and consciously aware of okay that's racist that's not right that's hate but then you anti-racist would even push it further to say but I'm going to do the work to make sure that we break those systems that narrative down mm -hmm. right um, let me give you an example um, you know a couple years ago I had a personal experience happen to me where someone had made a racist comment to me about being uh, Mexican and causing trouble and um, you know in my anger and frustration I had to leave right because you know what does confrontation look like um, what does conflict look like in that moment especially in, in the church um, but I, I thought about it more and more I said you know I can allow this individual just to just to keep going and you know of course he's gonna say I'm sorry what I said was wrong which he did but then what I really wanted to help him do or I wanted to help him with was to break down that narrative and you got to call it out right do you believe that do you believe all Mexicans are causing trouble do you believe that all Mexicans should go back to the to Mexico and the border right 
Let's break that narrative down and let me educate you and help you to make sure that you don't carry that anywhere else anymore, right? You're doing it in a loving and gracious way, but you're breaking that down, right? Um, another example is, and I, and I look back at my high school days back in Oklahoma, um, we were required to take Oklahoma history um, in order for us to graduate. And uh, I took Oklahoma history my senior year. We never learned about the Tulsa race riots. And from Norman, Oklahoma to Tulsa was two hours away, right? I didn't learn about the Tulsa race riots, and so I started getting into my grad work in seminary, which was five years ago, right? Yeah, that's racist, right? What we had seen in Tulsa, what we read about, but anti-racist over a hundred years, right? But the anti-racist work would say, okay, this can't happen again. We have to educate. We have to make sure that we're teaching our kids history. We have to make sure that this is what happened so it doesn't happen again. Right? It's breaking down those narratives, it's breaking down those systems. Um, again, it's challenging, it's courageous work, but it's, it's life-giving work, it's life-giving work.